the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of Texas Southmost College District. Trustees present tonight are Ms. Adela Garza, Dr. Robert Lozano, Mr. Trey Mendez. Mr. David Oliveira will not be present today. He says he has court in uh, Edinburgh and will be out of uh, Brownsville for the week. And also, Mr. Torres called and said he would not be able to make it. I don't know if we're expecting Dr. Robles. We, we're not sure about Dr. Robles. Anyway, also present is Dr. Lily Tercero, president of Texas Southmost College. Announcements. I call on Dr. Lily Tercero to make the announcement. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm very pleased to announce tonight that uh, Dr. Robert Cuero, our vice president, uh, has been uh, reappointed to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board's Undergraduate Education Advisory Committee. That's a very, very important uh, committee because it's actually the committee that has been working on uh, recommending a new core curriculum statewide. Mm -hmm. He was actually appointed at the time and worked with a group and they, they did a new curriculum uh, committee, uh, a new core curriculum, but they've been brought back to do more work. And so he's been reappointed, so I'm really pleased uh, that he is, so he can stay abreast of some of the key areas in that, in, at that level. So, Robert, uh, congratulations, and I'm so glad that you're serving on that, on that committee. On another, uh, on another very sad note, um, I, am, uh, I, I regret to inform, uh, inform everyone, you may know, you may not know, that uh, Dr. Alberto Alfonso Besteiro has uh, passed away. Uh, Dr. Besteiro uh, was a proud native son of Brownsville, of those of you that know him. He was very committed to his community. And actually, becoming president of Texas Southmost College, was, uh, where he served here for eight years, uh, was what he so we're very sad to hear that. We will be bringing forth to the board a, a full resolution honoring him at the April meeting, and we are sending a letter uh, to his family for con uh, condolences and asking them hopefully they'll be, someone will be here uh, to accept the resolution. But uh, we in the college community are, are very saddened by his passing, and I just wanted to let you know about that. So thank you, sir. Those are my comments. Thank you. Item number three, public comments. Do we have any public comments? I call on Mr. Dino Chavez. Mr. Chavez, you'll, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the board, my name is Dino Chavez. I am a local businessman. Uh, I represent a company called National MGA Insurance Alliance. We've been around uh, for quite a while. I've been in the insurance business for Pretty, pretty long time, uh, almost 20 years. Uh, the reason I'm here today is to talk about, um, just briefly, some insurance proposals that you're considering today. Um, I know there's at least one insurance proposal that uh, theoretically all rates from any insurance agent should be the same uh, because the quoting entity, an entity called the Texas Windstorm Insurance Association, provides the same quotes for all agents so there's theoretically no difference between any, any, any rates any, you know, that you get from the same entity. Uh, the one big difference is that we were one of the entities that submitted for consideration, and I believe we're the only entity that's within your taxing district. So we appreciate some consideration in that. Um, the second thing is that uh, something that may or may not be in your packet of consideration is a, uh, an added value item that we've included, which is uh, to put together a report um, that analyzes the condition of all your buildings uh, so that when you go forward into the future you can look at the condition of the roofs, uh, pictures of the roofs, uh, etc. And, uh, and that is something that we will do free of charge as part of our proposal and it's included in our proposal uh, so that you can use it in your planning as you go into the future not only for insurance matters but also for uh, planning and maintenance matters that have to do with all your buildings. There's many, many buildings that you all have, and uh, it doesn't take very many of them to, uh, to you know, when, when you got to do some replacements, to actually add a significant amount of money to, to the budget. So uh, that's a, an added value that we add. And so I only got three minutes, so I'm going to limit my, what I say, but uh, I do appreciate your, uh, your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. 
the next item, mission statement. Texas Southmost College is a comprehensive open admissions public community college whose mission comports with the state statutes, subchapter A, section 130. Texas Southmost College offers programs leading to certificates of completion and associate's degrees, developmental education to prepare students for college level work, occupational and technical programs to prepare students for immediate employment, academic courses of study to develop the core skills, understandings, and knowledge appropriate for baccalaureate programs, and continued education, counseling, guidance, adult literacy, and personal enrichment. Texas Southmost College advances economic and social development, enhances the quality of life, encourages respect for the environment, cultivates personal enrichment, expands knowledge in service to its community. It convenes the cultures of its community and fosters an appreciation for the unique heritage of the Lower Rio Grande Valley. It provides academic leadership in the intellectual, social, cultural, and economic life of the region it serves. Texas Southmost College places excellence in teaching and learning at the core of its commitments. It seeks to help students at all levels develop the skills which will sustain lifelong learning while respecting the dignity of each learner and the needs of the entire community. Next item, consideration and approval of meeting minutes of the February 29th, 2012 meeting. <clears throat> Move to approve the minutes. I have a, pro uh, a motion to approve by Mr. Mendez to approve the meeting minutes of the February 29th, 2012 meeting. Uh, do I have a second? I can't. I, I, was, I was absent. Yes, sir. I, I have a second by Dr. Lozano. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I always, I always uh, we have one abstention. The motion is approved. Consideration and approval of proposal for windstorm and hail property insurance. I call on Mr. Chet Lewis, Vice President for Administration and Finance, to present the item. Mr. Lewis. Chairman and uh, Board of Trustee members and Dr. Cicero. Um, you have a lot of information in your packet, so I'm going to try to give you a, a brief overview to make sense of uh, volumes of data. As you remember, um, UT system used to provide uh, our insurance for fire and other apparels, and also for excess coverage of wind, and also they would give it, would have been providing excess coverage on flood. Uh, we had participated in that pool with them for a period of five years, and as we were going through the termination, they gave us notice last year that we would not be participating in this beyond this year. The policies end um, March 31st, and so we need to establish new policies by April 1st. When we're looking at the, uh, the wind, well, there's two aspects of wind. The first is uh, covered by the Texas Windstorm Insurance Agency, and they will insure buildings up to a certain point. Uh, that maximum is this year $4.424 million per occurrence and per, per building. Um, beyond that, you have to look at ec um, procuring excess wind coverage. Now, for example, our, um, the Fine Arts Building, it's, it's worth uh, over $25 million between the building and its contents. TWIA, TWIA would only cover, or the Texas Wind Storm Insurance Agency, it's called TWIA, um, it would only cover $4.4 4. 4 million. And so you would have to purchase additional coverage in case uh, there was a disaster that took it beyond those type of limits. And so that's why we look at the two um, uh, items. The, the way the UT system um, pool had worked is that we would purchase the TWIA and historically have purchased the TWIA and had an agent that uh, we brokered through the college. And then we were participating with the UT system beyond that point. So uh, I want to start off talking about the TWIA coverage and then we'll move on to the excess wind, wind coverage. We've had three bidders um, bidding on the, the TWIA coverage. Uh, TWIA is provided through the state of Texas, and uh, you're going to see that we have three differing bids uh, for the TWIA coverage. Um, we also um, bid these on, on different increments with different deductibles. Uh, the, if, if the bids were put in exactly the same, um, the, the premium would be the same because the pricing would be the same. Um, you're going to see the, the amounts of 827789 for RN Jones Agency. Uh, that's the current agency that we currently have our TWIA covers through. Uh, and that's at the 1% deductible level. We have the Clevin Agency, 
Uh, they, they're listed out of Prosper, Texas, which is up in the Dallas area, but they have an association with an agency here in Brownsville also. Uh, they put in a bid at 837-306. Uh, the, the, the reason that we have a difference in those two bids is we, we provided a spreadsheet and there were four items in the category of the, uh, of the wind co uh, coverage for the building uh, as far as the rating structure. You know, buildings are rated on whether they're wind resistant, semi wind resistant, brick, um, heavy construction, I think the other one is frame. Um, there, there were four items in our spreadsheet that not ha had not been updated. Uh, if they had been updated, the um, the R.N. Jones bid and the Clement Agency bid would have looked exactly the same. Uh, the Texas Insurance Service Center is uh, at 859,074, and there, there, we found that there was a num number of misclassifications off the spreadsheet that we had provided. Um, at, at this point time, um, when we're looking at the various um, amounts for the deductibles, we asked for the proposal of a 1% deductible, the 2%, the 5%, and then R.N. Jones also gave an alternate proposal. We feel it's in the best interest of the college to go ahead and stay with, with our current uh, policy, which is consistent of having a 1% deductible, and that the pricing for that would be at the $827,789. Um, we reviewed the agency's qualifications. They all appear very qualified. And all things being equal, we've had a good experience with the R.N. Jones agency and we would recommend a continuation with them because of the uh, years of service that we've had with them. And they have actually, um, it, I was told through UT system that they had gone through and found some savings in previous years for us. Um, however, it's up to you to, to make a decision on uh, which policy you would be interested. This, the second one that's up for consideration is the excess wind insurance. Uh, and you'll see that we only had one bidder on that. It was Shepard Walton King. And essentially, when you look at TWIA, <coughs> TWIA is the coverage is by building and by occurrence. And with <coughs> excess wind coverage, it's a blanket coverage over all, all of the uh, facilities that we have. Um, one of the, the things that was brought to our attention that um, Shepard Walton King had gone out to the market and procured, procured interest in providing our wind coverage in January and some of the agents found that they were not able to produce a bid. Um, in a perfect world, I'd like to go back and rebid that so everyone has an equal chance. However, it would probably take uh, 60 to 90 days to get another policy. So at this point, I think it would behoove us to go ahead and accept one of the, the bids that we do have here and look at rebidding this next year. The, the amounts that we have for coverage there is $359,316.75 for $50 million of excess coverage. And 75, for, at the $75 million uh, blanket coverage, we would have $390,789.75. Um, one of the things that we did do, we did some due diligence to make sure that that's a fair rate, since that we only had one bidder. And when I spoke with the um, insurance agents up at UT System, and some of the other um, agencies that are bidding on some of the other items, they did confirm that that seems like that is a fair rate. Um, also, when you look at the um, coverage, we're, we're receiving similar coverage in some aspects, and, and in some aspects, the coverage is a little bit better. Because if you recall, uh, through the insurance bullet UT system, there's a shared risk component uh, of a substantial uh, amount of the coverage that we have. And then this would um, apply 100% to us. Uh, also, we wanted to make sure that the coverage was adequate because the, the design of the two um, insurance uh, policies are different. And when we were discussed this with a number of people, they felt $50 million was an adequate amount of excess coverage. In fact, some school districts and some entities don't even take the excess coverage. So at this point, we would recommend that uh, we also include in the motion to accept the quote for the $50 million of excess coverage. Uh, for three hundred fifty-nine thousand three hundred sixteen dollars and seventy-five cents with Shepherd Walton and King. Um, Chet, on yes. that on that excess coverage, that excess wind. That is just excess wind. That's correct. Okay. Uh, one, one thing I will point out: uh, the, the UT system policies had were built on uh, for the, their, their excess coverages. It was built on the excess of TWIA and also the excess of NFIP. 
and there was an assumption that we were take, making sure that we had carried our base NFIP, um, and the, we only have two buildings that actually have coverage on, on the NFIP currently, and they're the ones that are required through the Stafford Act that they're in the high parallel areas. Uh, that would be the at Port Isabel, and in, I, I'm sorry, at South Padre Island and Port Mansfield. Um, what I'd like to do is go back and also look at some other buildings and bring to you a recommendation to include some of our other buildings under the NFIP program as well. Do we know on this excess coverage, it's, if it, you say it's just wind coverage, you know that TWIA is going to cover about $4 million per building. So yes. how many buildings actually exceed the $4 million limit on TWIA? I think there's about 10, 12 buildings. Uh, and I'll give you an example of a few of the buildings here. Okay. Um, I have information that you might have. Oh, sure. Because there's 23 buildings that go over the 4.5 million. Um, basically, you have um, six or seven big ones, so the biggest one being I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm Renetta Orpesa with Shepherd Fault and King Insurance. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, basically, your largest building over that is the 56.5 million at iTech. I realize you're not using all of that. Um, it is replacement cost. Um, your next biggest one, um, and these are the amounts over the $4 million, um, is your REK building, which is $22.2 million in excess of what you have with TWIA. Um, the Art Center is $21.6 million over. The library is $11.1 million over. And then you've got the Oliveira Memorial Library at $5.9 million over, and um, one of the classrooms at $5.1 million over. Those are your biggest ones. You've got some smaller ones um, for a total of 23 um, buildings over. but. Those are the your largest buildings that go over. And who would the coverage be with? What's the entity, the company? Okay, it's underwriters at Lloyd's. It's what they call Amrisk. It's underwriters at Lloyd's. It's QB Specialty. It's Princeton. Um, they all come on one policy, but they're all sharing the risk. Okay. Thank you. And essentially, we had gone through and identified some of the higher amounts, and we actually. When you look at the top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven buildings, that makes up a, uh, the TWIA coverage is covering $97,868,035. Um, uh, the total coverage of all of our buildings is a little over 235 million, so that means we have about a little over 137,000 that's uncovered. If you look at those seven buildings along with their contents, um, there's a, another $12 million that's allocated to various buildings, but there, there's 10 buildings that are the primary largest buildings. And um, I know that later on, I think you're going to ask us about uh, the, uh, the other property policy in the pool. There's yes, we will be discussing that later. Do you know if um, they offer excess coverage? Excess wind coverage? Because sometimes those kinds of uh, risk pool carriers actually offer excess coverage, so long as you're covered with TWIA for the max. Uh, along with the people that bid on, on the wind insurance, um, the, we're, we're going to be making a recommendation to you through the fire and other perils uh, through a risk pool. And they do have the ability to do um, excess coverage. Um, they found the same situation. The market had been essentially blocked from trying to get enough coverage to prepare an adequate response. The policy is going to expire in a few days. It will expire by the end of the month. How do these costs compare to what we had last year? Okay, the 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 TWIA bid is actually very comparable. Last year for TWIA, we had eight hundred twenty-four thousand and sixty-six dollars. Um, as far as the outflow, and this year it's 827,789. Now, the, the increase is actually a little higher than that, and the reason for that is when you look at the comparison of the buildings, um, I excluded the village because uh, we were moving forward to with plans to potentially demolish that, so it didn't make any sense to uh, take two, the TWIA coverage for over the, the summer while we're going to be tearing it down. Now, in, in relationship to the <coughs> The other coverage, um, like on fire and other apparels, and then the excess wind, that was actually combined in a premium. And um, the amount we were paying to UT system uh, last year was 275670 But um, compared to the policies that we're looking at, there were substan substantial differences in the deductibles. 
um, especially when we looked at the wind. Um, we were looking at uh, sections where uh, you had a, a big chunk of self-insurance, and then on top of that, there was a significant layering of another, another deductible on top of that. So the, the two products are not compared apples to apples. And one of the things that, that it was a little bit better on the UT system policy, it, it has some business continuity, and so we're going to look at some the possibility of pricing that same type of function in here. And so the difference between 827 and 837 of R. N. Jones and Clement um, is what is, there's a different ratings on a couple yeah. buildings. O ultimately, when, when um, the TWIA goes through and looks at those two, two, it, it will gravitate back down to the same dollar amount. There's no, I mean, the difference in other, the other one is, is significantly higher too, but there's no agency fees or any. Um, uh, the, the, all the commissions and the fees for, uh, for TWIA are set exactly the same, and so every bid, uh, once we had done the review and had done some verifications, would come in at the same dollar amount. I just have a problem with, because we've done it this way, because there were, the, we've done business with them, we're going to retain them, but when do we give somebody else a, a, an opportunity to, to, to prove themselves? And and uh, I'm always going to choose local. Um, th th that, that's a policy that could be set by the board. If you wanted to ro rotate through somebody every so often, you could do that. If you wanted to um, pick your criteria, um, th that's a decision you get to make tonight. There, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, board members, there, there really was a, a very close, it was a very close um, review wasn't a chat yes. uh, between these two. Um, <clears throat> if, if you so choose to go one versus the other, I think uh, we could work either way. Um, but uh, looking at it from the standpoint of, of, uh, of business continuity, uh, it was a reason I think we selected to recommend the, the current one. But honestly, so close, you could go either way. So, you know, it'll be, you know, we could work with either uh, or. But, you know, in normally when you're looking at these kinds of issues, they, uh, one of the things that you look at is, is histor historical work with uh, the entity that you've been involved with and uh, the continuity of maintaining the relationship. But uh, you bring up a good point, too, in terms of the opportunities to give others. So <laughs> it could go either way. <laughs> because if, if, if we go by, we've always done it this way, then, then another company never has an opportunity to prove themselves to us that, that they're just as good or better. To me, it doesn't matter who the company is. It really matters who the insurer is. It's all the same, I think, for an agency, as long as they combine the policy. After that, you deal with the insurance company. Earlier, you mentioned something about recommending next year to, to bid out again. Which one were you talking about then? Uh, the the access to insurance. Um, I had a number of people express uh, concern that they felt like they didn't have the opportunity to participate. And so I'd like to make sure that, even though this looks like it is a good and fair Price, pricing for the uh, additional excess wind coverage. I just want to make sure that all everyone has the same chance to go through and do this. In, in talking to um, uh, s some people in the insurance agency, uh, I, th I think the recommendation next time is that we will uh, procure a broker who will go out and look at the markets and assign certain markets to certain people who are interested in bidding. And then that way everybody has a chance to uh, prepare a bid and we'll make sure we do it with adequate pre preparation time so that we can uh, move forward and, and everyone has a participatory process in this. Yeah, how do you eliminate this blocking situation from happening in the future? Because, right. I mean, we don't have much of a choice. And it's kind of like by right. certain actions they made us not have a choice. Right, and, and that, that's where I, I wanted to go through and make sure we did the due diligence to make sure that it was a fair price and you know, did check with a number of areas. Um, and if we had a little more time, you know, I, I would say let's go ahead and reopen this. But at this point, knowing the hurricane season is just right around the corner, if, if we're, we want to make sure that we have that type of excess coverage, we probably should go ahead and proceed with this. And then, and, and typically, you know, when we pick in our insurance agents, agency, we'll keep them for three years. Um, but this this particular one, I'd like to rebid again next year. I, I agree. I think as long as we don't have it blocked next year, um, and if we were to rebid it. It, it would open for, we couldn't do it for 60 days, don't you say? It'd be 60 days it, it, um, people, people need at least 60 to 90 days just to go through the process. And then it's also going to take a, while, a little time to do the advertisement. Uh, a hurricane season officially is here um, June 1st, but uh, there are instances uh, of as early as May. 
And um, even though usually the the bigger hurricanes are later in the season, I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you when they're going to hit. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and I think our fiduciary duty as trustees doesn't allow us to leave properties uninsured. Right. I don't think we can do that to the district either, unfortunately. So. Back on the TWIA, uh, you're saying everything's equal, but uh, Ms. Garza was ad uh, addressing something about are any of them from the taxing district? Everybody's local. It seems like everybody has local connections, but anybody from within our taxing district? I don't think any of the agencies are homed within the taxing district. Um, the, Cle the Clement agency has an association with uh, uh, an insurance agency that is within our taxing district, and the other two are from Harledge, and w which are within our service territory. But not our taxing district. Har Harledge is not in our taxing district. We'd be happy to include them. Then they'll have a fair chance. That's a good point. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me which company we choose, really. If, it, if it's all the same, it, it doesn't matter to me. So uh, It matters to me. I, I like to go local if, if we can. I like to go within our taxing district. I just kind of feel like there are so many changes so fast and furious that going, I, I kind of I'm leaning toward just because we're going to re it out in the year, um, just staying with you know, people who we have uh, already built up a relationship with until we can sort of get our feet up there. We've got all these exchanges. You know, we can you know, hold on to one relationship and we can certainly bid it out and move it around. And we have a hurricane season every year. I think, I don't think it's that much of an issue as far as the information wise. I think they've already quoted it. They have all the information on the building and it's already been quoted. I think now it's just a matter of binding it, which is not that tedious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just, just to clarify, oh, uh, whenever we would go out for a TUI bid, uh, that would always be done by Texas Southmost College. And that's why we have an existing relationship with one of, one of the agencies. However, no matter what, with the excess wind, we would have had a new provider. And that is because of the fact that we are not going to participate with the UT system pool on that section of the coverage. I already said what I was going to say. Well, it's up for consideration. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion that we, that we go with, the, with the, our local insurance agent. Which would be who? Which would be, the is Clement. that Clement? Mm -hmm. The Clement agency. I've got a motion by Ms. Garza to um, select Clement agency and authorize the president to execute a contract at approved terms and deductibles. Do I have a second? Can I ask a question? Um, Trent, you said that the price would go back down to the same? Well, once, once they make those adjustments uh, for the ca uh, categories, it would, it would be priced exactly the same. Yes. Do we have a second? I'll second. I have a second by Mr. Mendes. Do you have any further discussion? No further discussion. All in favor? Okay. Aye. Aye. Dr. Lozano opposes. So uh, three in favor, one opposed. Motion carries. Uh, before we finish this item, we also need to um, make a motion on the excess wind coverage. Chipper yeah. wanted one. Then we have a choice. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 well we, we have a choice on the <laughs> they made it for amounts. Us. And, and so we were, we were recommending that we go at the 50 million amount. OK. And you were also, just for the record, uh, recommending the 1% on the previous day. Yes. OK. Yes. Right, um, I'll go ahead and make the motion to approve the 1% uh, deductible, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, 50 million excess coverage. So I have a motion from Mr. Mendez to approve Shepard Walton King for the $50 million coverage and authorize the president to execute a contract at approved terms and deductibles. Yes, sir. Uh, second by Dr. Lozano. Any further questions? All in favor? Okay. Aye. Motion I'd like to say, Chairman, though, on, on that first one, if that bid doesn't go back down to the 827, would you please let us know? Absolutely. Okay. Next item. Consideration and approval of contracts for election services. I call on Mr. Chet Lewis, Vice President for Administration and Finance, to present the item. Mr. Lewis. 
The item before you is to approve a lease of equipment with the with Cameron County. Um, in, in prior years, uh, the county has provided all the election services for us. However, this year, um, the, the only thing that we're going to be having a contract with them is for the lease of, of certain equipment. Um, you have the contract in front of you, and the amount that we're looking at is $27,540. And so this is going to be some of the various voting machines and, and the uh, items that we'll need for the election. And we're asking for your approval. Did you look at the amounts and did you kind of do um, some checks on the prices? Uh, as far as what the lease amounts are? Okay, uh, on, on these amounts, it, um, this is cheaper than what we were originally looking at. And that is because these amounts, um, if we went on the market and leased them individually, it would be about 50% more. Um, by law, when the county is leasing equipment, I believe they only can charge 10% above what their uh, actual cost in the uh, voter equipment is. Okay. I was, is it, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. We have an agenda. Pardon? I'm so, uh, we, have an, we have the agenda item. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Now, all I want to say is that, you know, I'm the other agent on TWIA. What occurred tonight is illegal. The gentleman making the presentation is not licensed for property cash. He cannot stand up here and make a presentation to you. It is illegal. Okay? So all I want to say is that what happened was not legal because he's not licensed. I'm sorry to move on. Mr. Lewis, on, on the uh, back to the uh, elections issue. Yes. Uh, we don't have the item on here, but uh, we were looking for a consultant on that. Um, where do we stand on that? Well, because <laughs> I, see, I see Mr. Ortiz there, and I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I wonder yeah. if we could still recruit him um, to help us out. I, I, I think we have some good news. Um, we were in the process of working through um, a company that it has, been, uh, there's a gentleman who's been servicing the equipment at a former position and he's now with another company. And that gentleman is, does the programming of the equipment and also uh, takes care of a lot of the coverage in, and the oversight to make sure everything goes smoothly on election day. He's been working in uh, the area uh, of Cameron County for quite a, a long time, is familiar with our elections. And the company also provides additional election services and so he's working up a quote to help us with all the other aspects of putting on the election. And so ho hopefully we're going to get that quote from him shortly and be able to ha have some additional help uh, through our process. So at this point, we're looking uh, for a motion to accept the lease agreement with Cameron County for the lease of election equipment and authorize the president to execute a contract. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Mendez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Garza. Any discussion? Just one more question again. Is this, what does this look like? Is this the same things that we're familiar with? Is it the it, th this is the exact same equipment that would have been previously used in other elections. And so, um, if the county was providing the service, this is the equipment they, they had been using. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is approved. Chairman, um, in regard to the issue that the other agency brought up, um, I Go think ahead. Chet just yes. looking to that issue that he mentioned. Absolutely. If for some reason there was some something that's contrary to existing law, then we may have to have a special meeting to readdress it prior to the time that it's bound. So, okay. Can you please? Look uh, into yeah, that? I'll definitely look into that. Um, uh, again, you know, the person the person that made the proposal is the climate agency. And so if there was an issue that somebody else got up here and spoke on that behalf, then we will address that. So I'll, I'll work with Frank on that one. We have con consideration and approval proposal of, for the comprehensive insur protect insurance protection plan through the interlocal agreement with TASB Risk Management Fund. Mr. Lewis. As we had mentioned before, um, our fire and other perils um, insurance was handled through UT system and so we will need to have a new uh, insurance policy in place for April 1st 
Um, one of the things that we thought, because we didn't have a bid proposal um, designed specifically for fire and other perils, that we would go ahead and move forward with a, a, um, a, a basically an insurance uh, governmental pool that services school districts and community colleges. Uh, currently, the TASB risk pool services approximately 10 other community colleges for fire and other perils, and I believe that with their other policies, they have they service a significant other uh, amount of community colleges, so they're very familiar with the market. Um, I also inquired about their reputation, and UT system it, it spoke very highly of them, and the other agents uh, agents I spoke with also mentioned that you know they're, they're very have a very reputable re reputation. It's being redundant there um, within the state of Texas. So um, what we have so here. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I said it was redundant. I admitted it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it wasn't an unreputable reputation. How's that? <laughs> um, uh, our, our deductible before on uh, fire and other perils uh, was significantly higher, uh, but typically when you're looking at policies uh, um, that, that's bid out through the market, they're usually at fifty or hundred thousand dollar deductibles. Um, and like, like I said, we had so this is actually more coverage than we had had previously um, to cover the entire two hundred thirty-five thousand dollars of assets, which would be our buildings plus the contents. At a fifty thousand dollar deductible, the amount is two hundred forty-five thousand six hundred forty-six. Uh, if we wanted to go at the hundred thousand uh, um, dollar level, uh, that would be two hundred thirty-one thousand five hundred twenty-nine. Uh, our recommendation is to go ahead and put that at the $50,000 deductible level for the 245 646 And uh, we'd also like you um, to, when you're accepting this recommendation, to approve Dr. Seto to enter into an interlocal agreement with the task for your The uh, deductible you mentioned, does that include, is there a vehicle coverage, like for security vehicles? and? Our, our vehicle coverage is actually separate, okay. and right now Shepard, Walton, King um, has the <coughs> policy. Okay. Well, yep. One of the things to point out also, you know, this is a risk pool. Uh, there, there's a presumption that it is a, a fair price, but we also um, spoke with a number of other insurance agencies, including UT System, and did a comparable amount. And um, this, this, uh, the, the advice I received that this is a fair um, pricing for this amount. Um, and, and this is something also, if we want to go out in the future, we can. But yeah, it, it, I, I think at this point, dude, this is a a good opportunity to enter into this and pick up the coverage for April 1st. Most risk pools give the opportunity to save quite a bit of money, but there's other legal ramifications later on if you have problems right. that kind of factor in. Yeah. I think uh, it saves the district quite a bit of money. Could you repeat the deductible you're recommending and, and, and the rate? Um, at this time, we're recommending that we enter into an agreement with the, um, the, the TASB risk pool. Uh, in an interlocal agreement and to allow us partic to participate in the pool and that uh, we go with the deductible per occurrence of $50,000 for the fire and other peril uh, for the annual contribution of $245,646. That 245, how does that compare to the, last year? That compares fa favorable. Uh, um, we, as some of the other insurance agencies um, identified um, some amounts in different areas and the, the pricing seems like it's, it's a fair price. Um, obviously, if we haven't done a comparison, we don't uh, have the other bids to look at, but, but using the advice, I, I felt very comfortable with this amount. So we're looking for a motion to approve the proposal from TAS B, Risk Management Fund to provide property casualty coverage and authorize the president to execute a contract with a $50,000 deductible at a rate of 245000 What else was it, Mr. Lewis? Yes. 245000 how much? 646 So, I was jumping ahead to the next agenda item. 245646 245646 Listen to Mr. Mangus. He's telling us. It's actually a packet. Thank you, Mr. Mangus. <laughs> Which floor? I couldn't find it. Searching the wrong tab for Anyway, uh, do I have a motion for that? So more. I have a second. Second. I got a second by Mr. Mendez. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is approved. Next item, consideration and <coughs> approval of budget amendments for fiscal year 2012. Mr. Lewis? Uh, we have two items for the budget amendments. Uh, the first is to recognize the, the sale of the brick that um, the board approved 
uh, several months be, um, before. Uh, the total amount of the proceeds are $186,690. Um, we are recognizing that in the facility fund and then um, reducing the corresponding transfer into the facility fund from our, our, our general fund. The second amount is a, a uh, small amount of $2,025. Uh, we, we found that there was an invoice related to one of the bond projects uh, that had not been paid. Uh, we did confirm that it was due. And so in order to make the payment, we need to make sure we have the uh, amount put into the budget. How do you just find a statement that hasn't been paid? I mean, that happens uh, at home, but it shouldn't happen here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was sent forward uh, again, and apparently whenever they had sent it the first time, I'm not sure where that went. Um, it, it happened probably over a year ago, and but it, like I said, we did do our due diligence, and it was an amount owed. Okay. We have to pay it. Yes. So we're looking to approve the uh, budget amendments. Number 12-003 for fiscal year 2012 as presented by Mr. Lewis. So moved. Motion by Ms. Garza, second by Dr. Lozano. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is approved. <laughs> report on TSC transition team. I, doc I call on Dr. Leonardo De La Garza, TSC consultant, to give the report. Dr. De La Garza. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. Thank, Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, board members, uh, Dr. Tercero, uh, I wish to provide you a, a brief report on the, the activities of the transition team. Uh, first item uh, has to do with the schedule on negotiations for campus facilities with UT system. Uh, there, there has been agreement uh, to a May-June time frame for conducting the actual negotiations uh, with the UT system. Uh, this schedule uh, accommodates the continued assessment uh, of the uh, inventory of campus facilities by the TSC team. We touched on this briefly the last time uh, with the, the uh, consultants uh, who are actually doing that. Uh, and um, it, it's a work in progress, uh, close to completion, uh, but this will allow that, that to be con uh, completed. Thirdly, this uh, schedule accommodates uh, the appropriate involvement by Dr. Tercero of the Board of Trustees, who, of course, will need to approve any actions regarding uh, what, uh, what happens with college facilities with regard to ownership or divesting uh, of any of those uh, <coughs> facilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, a date of April 16th has been agreed upon for a transition team meeting uh, for, for developing the negotiations process, uh, which of course uh, will uh, have a discussion about the products of, of that uh, process and the schedule of negotiations starting on April 16th. This will be a meeting in Austin at the UT Systems uh, office. The second item uh, I will report to you has to do uh, with something we touched upon uh, last month, and that is uh, that there is now confirmation of a SACS uh, plan and activity meeting. Uh, you will recall that we mentioned that Dr. Tercero and Aguero will travel to Atlanta and will be attending planning sessions with SACS official on a date that has now been uh, designated as April 11th and 12th. Uh, this will confirm the SACS approved timeline uh, to include uh, TSC to become fully operational, you will recall, by the fall of 2013, uh, and which is necessary for the college to achieve full accreditation again by the date that's been mentioned over and over, August 31, uh, 2015. The, the actual opportunity for the college to become fully operational uh, means that the college will be able to offer instruction, have all the support services uh, to do that in order to comply with SACS requirements that you, you prove your ability to operate the college and do it uh, effectively and efficiently. And so that's the importance of having the, the actual uh, fall of 2013 fully operational uh, timeline. Dr. And if I may, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, 
uh, board members, uh, that will occur under the existing accreditation, which is the UTB TSC accreditation. Right. Uh, Both entities, as, as uh, you may well know, we, uh, are still under that accreditation, UTB as TSC. But we have the opportunity to, to move forward with the, our operations. Just as a clarification. Yes, and uh, that's very, very important to note. Uh, uh, the, uh, the actual accreditation continues under the UTB TSC uh, accreditation by SACS until the separation in 2015. But there's no there's no risk that, that UT will be accredited and TSC won't. No, the accreditation is, 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 a, is an accreditation of both institutions at the end of the separation. Should there be an issue, uh, which we certainly don't anticipate, then the accreditation would continue for both institutions under the TSC uh, 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 UTB partnership uh, accreditation that is, is that is bestowed by SACS until such time as both institutions are separately accredited. And I think the statute itself provides a safeguard for that within the statute to where that's not that's not going to happen. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, report on tuition and fees. I call on Dr. Lili Tercero, president of Texas Southmost College, to present this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Here we go. I'm pleased to provide to you this afternoon, or this evening, actually, I guess, um, a report on the uh, tuition and fees uh, across the state of Texas in regard to uh, <coughs> community colleges. It's an issue that uh, we will be looking forward to uh, discussing with you in the next few months. Uh, and I'll have a final conclusions at the end of, of, of this report. But basically, it's, this is a very important element in our planning process, particularly in regard to the financial uh, aspect. and to what we will be able to provide to our students. So I thought that this would be a really good idea for us to go through uh, and review this. Uh, I start with the overall perspective of the state. When you look at it, and all of this is just the community colleges, when you look at the Texas Community College state average, and, and I'm looking at spring, which is the latest, you will note here that we, uh, for the blue is the in-district, tuition rate statewide. The red are the out of district rates. Per credit hour, right? Yes, sir. This is for semester uh, uh, semester credit hour. If you notice down here on my note, it's tuition and fees totals calculated for a student enrolled for 12 semester credit hours. Uh, then the, the green one is the uh, non-resident, non-resident Texas uh, or out of state uh, individuals, so the, always higher. But when we look at the in-district, what you note is that the in-district uh, and the actually out-of-district uh, tuition rates have increased about 24% between 2009 and 12. Uh, when you look at the uh, out-of-district tuition rates, the red one, they've increased by about 26%. The majority of the increases, you will note, actually took place between the 11 and, and, and 12 fiscal years. Uh, that's when the big jump occurred in, in actually all the areas from 66 to 73 dollars for uh, in district. That is basically about an, an almost an 11 percent increase. A lot of it had to do, I believe, with what was happening at the state level with the appropriations, uh, state appropriations, and a lot of community colleges had to take action in order to address the uh, lack of state funding uh, and the changes that had occurred at that place. But uh, uh, overall, there has been some increases, and I think it's, again, as I say, it's related to uh, this, the big component of our, our uh, state appropriations dollars. I went further and decided to give you a, a breakdown by each area, area, which we start off with the in-district. This is from highest to lowest in regard to the semester credit hours. Again, it's for a 12 credit hours of a semester, and the ranking and the, the individual colleges that are included here, except for South Texas, are 
within what the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board has identified <laughs> as uh, the peer group, they entitled large community colleges. There are four different levels, a very large, a large, a medium, and a small. And so here is, we fall within the large category based on the existing enrollment numbers of about uh, 11,000, uh, 10,000 something, and most 11,000. So UTBTSC is currently ranked number one, having the highest uh, tuition rate uh, total of semester credit hour of $2, $208. The average, state average, is 73. Um, this basically uh, tells us that it uh, uh, our, the TTB TSC uh, tuition and fees are almost three times the state average. And uh, when we look at a comparison of UTB and South Texas College, which is our closest uh, community college near us, we're looking at about uh, UTB TSC having uh, almost double uh, those at uh, South Texas College right here. Uh, all the others are, are, are closer to the state average. When we look at out of district, uh, uh, you see UTB is ranked second uh, here. The, the number one is actually um, Austin Community College. Uh, they have a higher rate for out of district. Uh, I think part of their strategy there has been is that they have been looking to annex a lot of their areas around there, and I think that that was, may have been one of their strategies, uh, just a guess, but uh, then you go down and you see the others are, the average, state average is 112, uh, ours is 208. South Texas is uh, actually the same as a state average in this case right here. An important uh, note here to make is that UTB TSC currently does not have a, a, a different, uh, a differential between in-district and out-of-district tuition. Uh, at this time. Normally, or at least on a state average, what you find is that if you look at this number here and then look at this number here, which is the in-district, uh, that's about a 53% difference. And so that's what you normally see in community colleges. Students that are within the district basically paying taxes uh, have a lower tuition rate that they have to pay as compared to those students that are outside of the taxing district, and that's the normal among all community colleges. The non-resident tuition, uh, you will note here, uh, UTB TSC is at 521. The average is 163 per semester credit hour. Uh, a very uh, big difference there. Uh, again, it's uh, about three times higher than the state average and about two times higher than the uh, that at South Texas College which is right here. That non-resident is that international students? Or? That would include anybody outside of, of the state of Texas. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Now Another important comparison, um, as I was going through the process, I went over to look at what UT Pan American uh, students were paying. And for spring 12, uh, UTB students uh, taking 12 semester credit hours are paying almost as much as uh, students at UT Pan American. A very little, little difference there. Um, and similar numbers actually for uh, uh, the Texas A&M at Kingsville. Uh, I didn't put this information here, but uh, they were about $3,000 for residents and about uh, uh, 6768 for non-residents. Um, the findings based on the, the research that we did, uh, as you noted, uh, most likely as we went through this presentation, UTB TSE has the highest in district and uh, non-resident tuition and fees among all the 50 community colleges. We're the second highest in regard to out of district uh, behind only Austin Community College, and they're at 215. And our uh, the tuition and fees of UTB TSC are more closely aligned with those of regional universities than Texas public community colleges. Uh, so that's an area that uh, we will be looking at, as you see here in terms of our next steps. Uh, we will be looking at new tuition and fee tables. As, we're, as we work through this financial modeling, we're, we're, we'll be examining uh, options for you to review. We will bring forth those tables. 
uh, which will have two separate tables. We will have an in-district uh, tuition and fees table as well as an out-of-district tuition and fees table. And we'll bring that forth to you this coming fall so that we can prepare ourselves for the opening of the college in the fall of 13. Uh, we'll be bringing this forth by the spring. We will be able to prepare our own catalog. We will have our own TSC catalog. We will have our own uh, tables and everything in regard to that. And that's where you will see these differences uh, as we move forward. And again, they'll all be contingent upon uh, what we'll be doing in the next uh, few months. So uh, with that, I'd be glad to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Well, on the timeline, on the timeline, what you're ex explaining to us is that we'll be able to uh, let the public know what our future tuition and fees will be for the first semester that we, we that we will operate autonomously. Yes, sir. We will bring forth to you in the fall of this year uh, uh, a, a, uh, a recommendation. So we, you, once you approve it, we will be. It'll be. We can announce it. People will know, and it, it's wonderful because you'll be. They'll be able to start planning. Mm -hmm. uh, for the coming fall semester. It'll be effective fall 13, but they will know. And I think that's a very important uh, aspect. We also need to have that information so that we can include it in our catalog. And we need some time so we can work through the spring to get that catalog prepared. I think this is an issue that's really important to, to the board because uh, many of us ran on that issue during the campaign. So I, I'd like to maybe form a, a subcommittee to help in the review process. I don't know if anybody's interested in, 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 in doing that. I'll be interested. Yeah, I think most of us probably would. Executive work, though. Say again, Dr. Osama? No, I was just saying, we're reviewing the executive work. The, the review process of, of how we're going to analyze the, the uh, new tuition rate and, and we're... Maybe I would suggest that we could do a workshop on something. We can do that. We can have a workshop. Mm -hmm. We will be actually holding several workshops with you in the next few months, uh, Kim and I. Once we come back from uh, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools visit, we will have that timeline. And <clears throat> I've been working with Kim uh, and letting her know that we will be needing to set up some workshops. But I didn't want to do that until we got the final visit uh, from SACS, at least to get more confirmed what what we've got set up and see if they, they uh, bless it kind of for us. Well, I mean, I'm just saying <coughs> to you know, two new board members and people that need to be kind of educated and learn about this But I think a, a subcommittee would be important because then you can, you can add some people from the community, you can add some people from BISD. Well, I, maybe we can do a combination. We can do subcommittee to review now and then we'll do the workshops when we have the new board members after the uh, May elections. I think that might be a good a good way to do it. As long as we get them lowered, it doesn't matter how we get there. <laughs> well, some committee can we, only we have, have a, um, We do have a lot of work that still lays ahead in the next few months <clears throat> as we move toward really doing the analysis of, of the financial situation uh, and uh, the modeling that we're going to have to do to say, if we bring the tuition to this point, um, you know, what does that mean for the college in regard to state appropriation dollars? And what does that mean in regard potentially to uh, increases in enrollment, which will offset some of the costs, the reduction in, in, in the cost of, of uh, tuition? So there's a lot of scenarios we will have to do as staff to prepare that four-year four review. Um, so um, just, just know that that's a lot of work we're still having to do. <laughs> and <clears throat> we want to be sure that what we bring forth to you <clears throat> is as accurate uh, as, as possible. Uh, we do not want to bring something forth to you <clears throat> in a rush. Uh, I'd rather plan it out properly. I, I know some people say, you know, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm taking too much time, but I don't think we are. I think we're being very, very strategic and very deliberate in what we're doing. And I think in the long run, it will serve us and serve this institution very well. Will we be ready for a work uh, workshop by June? Oh, yes, sir. Actually, it'll be before June. Uh, we were looking, uh, we'll be coming back from, uh, on the 12th from, from eight in April from visiting with the accreditation people. By then, we should have a feel exactly what they want us to do. And we were thinking of setting one up uh, probably in May. Uh, and, and, and to tell you the truth, um, I, hope, I hope you don't get upset. We will have several workshops. Because as we go through the negotiations uh, period in the summer, 
Dr. Garza pointed out that we're looking at May, June, it may, 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 June, July. Uh, we will have to be coming back to you, which means we'll likely have to schedule some retreats, some special meetings with you as we talk with the transition team when we come back and we say, what do you think about this plan? And we need your blessing and your approval. Dr. Garcia, you don't know this, but in the past boards, we don't work in July. Oh, <laughs> well, then we're going to have to take care of things. That has not <laughs> been true since I've been on the board. Uh oh. <laughs> did, perhaps we did. We, we had to last month. It, would, would you consider taking an exception for <laughs> Oh, no. We all went to a meeting out of this thing. Well, we'll do what we can to avoid that. Um, uh, to okay. respect I'm that. <laughs> well, I, I, Thank I would, you. I would like the subcommittee, if, if Ms. Garza and Mr. Mendez and Dr. Lozano, would you be interested? Well, why don't you go ahead and participate in that? That way you have three board members as opposed to four. Which is, you know, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm giving you the choice if you want to, to go. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. And uh, then we'll look for end of probably middle or end of May. Yes, sir. For the first workshop on the topic. Mm -hmm. The workshop's going to be a board workshop, by the way. It'll be a full board, yes. board It'll be a post we'll, we'll have other board items workshop. to bring forth to you, including uh, program review information, things like that. We have quite a bit of materials to bring forth to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't leave, Dr. Tercero. You, you need to, uh, for the annual report of the TSC Foundation. Oh, yes, sir. I would like uh, to table that item for tonight. We have been uh, working with the... Uh, the uh, chairman of the foundation, and I would like to ask uh, if we could just postpone that they were not able to be here, and I'd like to continue working and visiting with them. Uh, we'll we'll uh, reschedule that. If it's not an action item, do I need a, a no, vote to table? No. So we just. Next item, executive session. The board will convene an executive session as provided by Government Code Chapter 551.071 and 551.072. We now reconvene from executive session. There is no action from the executive session, so we move on to item number, number 15, adjournment and announcement of the next meetings. We have a meeting date of April 19, 2012, and a meeting date of May 17, 2012. Do we have a motion for adjournment? Yes, sir. Motion to a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Stand adjourned. Good.